Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? No. No. Is this better? Yes. Is this better? Let me turn it up a little bit more. How about this? Better? All right. My name is Jessica McPhail. I'm the director of the Racine Public Library. Mr. Curdian is familiar to us because he's our first Emily Lee Award winner, which we, from the Library Foundation, award to somebody who has distinguished himself in the area of literature. He's blushing and has ties to Racine. We're very pleased to welcome him back, our native David Curdian. Please help me welcome. myself together here. Yes. You say the acoustics are good, you can hear. Mm. A little louder, David. A little louder. A little louder? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, just stand closer. How's that? I don't. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Thompsondale. We will never leave a picnic at Thompsondale. Our mothers ever beautiful in their summer dresses. Our fathers with straw hats and colored suspenders. A blanket spread upon the meadow, cane pole strung with bobbers dancing over the moving stream. The grape leaves gathered in the basket will never be taken home. The sandwiches will be eaten again and again. And clouds will gather in part. The sun will rise and recede. Night will come and then tomorrow again and again. <clears throat> Red River. Drawn into inlets by transparent minnows, suddenly gone to myself and following where they lead, I fall to my knees to catch them, though to catch them is not what I want. And they lead me to underwater grasses razor sharp pebbles and silt and mud hollows of tadpoles and star flecked sun spotted falls into a home I can never leave dreaming of fish breathing fish swimming into fish <laughs> that was my childhood as it was both dreamed and lived <clears throat> the one day we want some days to waken to that first morning where the golden sun shone on the window's ledge and with an odor that was sun and light and morning and something else. A something that made you turn to look and listen as if for the very first time, alone and cared for and free and loved when your mother was the only girl you would ever love and father would always defend. <clears throat> Yellow bricks for Dick Strieberl, Dickie Strieberl. <clears throat> there was no iron oxide in the thin vein of purplish clay running through the city's north side. And so when it was dried and kiln fired, it turned a pale yellow or cream color instead of the expected red. But we didn't know this then, nor did we think our bricks unusual or even unique of that place. Staring up at that yellow brick chimney across from our house, that seemed so special to me then, traveling straight up higher than any house or nearby building serving that factory it stood beside and the sparrows that lived there flying in and out out of those apertures near the top were not unique of course except to us because they moved among us as members of our tribe pecking on the sidewalk or on our tiny patch of grass beings of the air and ground with a dual existence to our one scrambling and scrounging like us and like us here and gone 
except they could leave by wing, suddenly, and seated atop their chimney, look down at us, ordinary citizens, dazed with life. Dafji Vartan, Dafji, Dafji, tambourine man, who came to our weddings and played and sang, Oud and Doombag, a three-man band, all the way from South Milwaukee and back again. So much for legend, memory, and song, men and instruments all long gone, Dafji, Dafji, this one last song. read this book when I come to a library. <laughs> it's called Our Library. <coughs> Built by Carnegie to fit our city's needs, it stood there as it does today, a solid square yellow brick two-story building on the corner of 7th and Main, just one block up from Monument Square and within sight of that great lake that I never failed to look out on upon each time I visited that place. I went there first with my mother to the story hour Saturday afternoons and then for books to take home until I was old enough to have my own card, searching the shelves with my growing needs, fascinated by the hushed silence of the place, the circular stairs that took me to areas I browsed, standing on the thick glass floors I marveled at. Downstairs there were books for older readers, along with the newspaper and magazine racks. Beside the table were so many sat who were there to escape the elements and to find in the journals and dealies some hope for their lives, or, barring that, an excuse for their presence in that holy atmosphere beyond the wind and rain and cold of day. My li library card was free and it would never date, for it was as renewable as my need. It was second in importance only to the streets where my first education took place that I would finally give shape and form to because of the learning and knowledge I had found within those walls where the spirit was aided to weld body to mind from a grace that only the printed word could provide. This is from a book called Letters to My Father. It's 40 some poems, they're all addressed to him. That's why I call it Letters. So he's, the, he's not named, that's who it is. When I think of the Chefis Bakery, I always think of you. Perhaps it has to do with bread, the staff of life, the one simple staple without which it seems there could be no meaningful life. The one thing the Armenians didn't sell or make themselves was their own pita bread, since it was already being made by the Greek family that lived above their bakery on Douglas Avenue, where we went every Sunday morning to bring their freshly baked pita to our homes. It was the tradition, the worn, familiar weekly ritual without which our simple lives would not have been complete. We'd slice it for sandwiches or to eat with our soup or to dip into the yogurt dish with or best of all to stuff with our kebabs, especially at picnics, along with the barbecued peppers, tomatoes and the marinated onions that gave it its special flavor in life. The pita was us, it was our family, and it was me and you together or alone walking the four <coughs> or five blocks to pick it up. <laughs> Why did this happen? <laughs> yeah, here we are, to, to our home once again, because a Sunday without it, and for as long as it stretched into the week, would have made the transition from old country to new, too unbearable for you, and much too confusing for me. 
because I needed what was old as much as what was new, even if I didn't fully understand this at the time. I used to go crabbing under Island Park Bridge for bait to go fishing with. And uh, for sure, if I knew my father would take me fishing on Saturday, the next Saturday. It was the smell of crabs that I know now was secretly sweet to me then, putting burdock leaves in the bottom of the bucket and sprinkling it with water to keep them moist and shiny while they crawled forward, their pincers making scratching sounds on the pail's ground, or darting backwards in a fury, believing or wishing they were still waterbound. I carried the bucket in one hand, my two cane poles in the other, and stopped always at the fountain in the park named after Umbaji, the lonely old Armenian man, and drank there always smelling the earthly pebbles, watching the water change the color of the perforated brass ball it flowed around, before stumbling and jiggling the pail to activate my crabs, who were my companions on the long walk to Lake Michigan that I always took alone. I was an only child for until I was 12, and. So I did most things by myself. I hated school, as everybody knows who's read anything of mine. <laughs> the art of kindergarten. For years I kept it, and then it was lost. My first report card. But you will not understand by that name what it was for me. It had come on rose-colored crepe paper, long and narrow in shape, and there were pasted down strips, perhaps typed, but more likely written carefully in a feminine, and this was important, practiced hand. Delineating all the things I had done in that class, puts on galashes alone, good at going down the slide. <clears throat> can shovel sand into a pail. <laughs> oh, I hope it said these things, because after that grade, everything went to hell. <laughs> I valued that card always because it was made with the hand carefully and talked about things I would always care to remember I had done. And so there were the events of my baby life, magically recorded on colored strips of paper carefully pasted down. My first gift of writing, the beginning of literature, my first unbound book. It would be a long time before another writing or any work of art would mean as much. <laughs> Can you hear me, Mag? Can you hear me, Mag? Can you hear me? I can hear you. You can? Hardly. Hardly? What'd you say? It's a little bit hard. A little bit higher. I think it's the mic. The problem is the mic. Okay. Unless she can turn it up from down below. I can hear you. She just said she can hear you. She can. So, like, try turning it up? Maybe. Is that better? Maybe that'll help a little bit. Itinerance. <clears throat> <laughs> what of the store what of the stores? Is it too loud? Yeah. yeah. It's too loud. <laughs> How's this? Yeah. How's this? Good. What <clears throat> of the stores that weren't stationary? The services that moved by foot and pedal and wagon, or pulled by man, or that were horse-drawn, also the pickup truck, weren't these the businesses closest to our hearts? 
because in our minds they were not businesses at all or even enterprises but something quite other that we couldn't quite define except to give them the name they were represented by. Mr. Miller, the radio repairman who smoked his cigar as no one else could, who came to our door with his satchel of tools. <clears throat> the rag, the rag and, wait a minute, sorry. The rag and paper man on his horse-drawn wagon his clipped, accented speech flitting the air, the stranger on bicycle with a contraption for sharpening scissors and knives, the horse house painter who gave us his life history and for no extra charge, <laughs> and best of all, the bicycle-propelled ice cream man with his musical bell that our sharp ears were tuned to hear from far blocks away. And we felt, without needing to make our claim, that this was the way to do business and the only way to be alive, not really realizing that these men were at the low end of the totem pole of economics without power or prestige, except for their influence over us, feeding our souls ahead of our bodies. And so I went on studying them from my armchair in the streets which was the seat of my pants, by which I sailed through my coming years, negotiating all my God-given rights over the tenure of that block. <clears throat> when my mother left Racine and moved to Fresno, I joined the family after college. And uh, this is where I first began writing poetry, in the backyard of my mother's house. Um, this one's called My Mother and the Hummingbird. As the green-winged hummingbird darts sideways into the leaves of our baby apricot tree, suspended, taking sugar with his quivering bill, I move in around the palm tree to have a better look. But my mother pushes open the window and says, right now, write a poem. <laughs> In the tradition. My family, my wife says, is all that is important to me. And saying that, she turns and gives her full attention to the Toll House cookies that will soon emerge from the batter being beaten by the mixture that frightens the cat. And so the three of us are in the kitchen, 11.15 p.m., a late night drink for me, a mild fright for the cat, and cookies for my wife. Family enough or not, this is who we are, where we live, and how it is done. It is part of the formula of life, and keeping it good and simple in a poem helps to give preeminence to life. Give thanks to my wife. The cat. Tessie descends the stairs, positions herself between us on the rug, blinks beguilingly, then falls on her side, resting. What to do? On one side, Nani studying books on gardening, already awaiting spring, and I on the other side, silently writing. But she likes it here, perfect for her or not. And there is a kind of quiet hum she hears. So many days have gone like this, so many more to come. The hollow in-breath, sensed but not seen, between be and become. I've given so many readings this week that I don't know where I am anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
You heard my saying. Okay. 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 Come on, Andy. On the death of my father, <laughs> dead now and forever, ceremony release him to the ground where once he played in tales that have been handed down. Cupped upturned hands lower through your spreading fingers this soil splashed man. You knew him first, that touch him last. His circling, fading time hovers over my head. His life my own to lose or live again. Take him, Earth, in final release. Toss him and catch him in your cloudy hands. He'll know your touch. His feet, when he comes to you, are sure to be bare. <clears throat> it's called oh, part three of the years this is from I think it's from taking the soundings on third avenue which is we were living in Manhattan at the time and it's I guess the name of the poem is Tanani Tanani in the afterglow of dinner on your face, new tablecloths and candles in another setting, in another town, that suddenly brings forward new talk of old failures, of life unspent, of opportunities gone. And it is this, this new discovery of self, swift and silent, even in speech, undiminished by the hour or year, your being that I suddenly see again and love. People keep re reminding me about the Armenian Fest. I guess it's a big deal in town. It was a big deal for us, but we had it at Johnson's Park and uh, pretty much only Armenians came. And my father was often, uh, often cooked there. Histories. What do we gain from our parents that was never ours, but in being theirs was ours? I wonder about the food and music, and especially the tongue, that never ceased to make me laugh or weep, because I realize now that our tongue has always been a member of the heart, not the head. A language for histories and passions spent, perhaps, but alive, alive always in the body of each man. I put all that aside because so many others could say it as well. And take one thing, one thing alone, that is mine, that no one else can touch or want to understand. My father at an Armenian picnic, dancing round and round and round. His whirling arms in the speech I could not understand. With a knife tightly clenched in his teeth, held fast forever in his bald and spinning head. Are you hearing these poems, Mac? You are? Oh, good. Uh, one of the things people have asked me several times to me about being an immigrant, as if I were an immigrant. I'm a native son, by the way. But um, I know a lot about the immigrant experience. And, and when I've written about the whole ethos of being an Armenian in Racine, the poems that made me proudest are the ones that incorporated both generations, our parents and then us. And uh, some of the poems have it kind of perfected in the sense of being in perfect balance. <clears throat> we were very rambunctious. I think the one thing I would say about Armenians 
one of the things I would say in their favor is that we have tremendous vitality. <clears throat> and, and the young kids, although they may have been held down in many ways, were very energetic, very resourceful, very creative, and always on the move. And I was certainly always one of them. <laughs> and the reason I have so much to write about, and I've written so many books uh, about my childhood as well as everything else, is because I have my eyes open. Um, so here's one called Chuck Pelavanian. We had certain lunacies in common, but the one I remember best was the idea of digging our own fish pond in your family's backyard. <clears throat> we went so far as to consult old man Cook, who ran the bait shack by the pier. He wasn't the first one to laugh at us, but he was the only one who took the trouble to explain why it couldn't work. No running water meant no oxygen, and even if the fish survived, they'd soon be swimming in their own shit. <laughs> Never mind, we decided to build a boat instead. At this point, our mothers brought our fathers into the act. Your dad had a car, very unusual, and together they took us fishing. We supplied the gear and enthusiasm. They got to provide everything else. None of us knew where we were to go or what to do once we got there. I think they figured we couldn't all fish out of one boat without at least three of us drowning. <laughs> and so, not finding a place to fish at Browns Lake, we worked our way back towards town, finally settling for a tiny pond at Johnson's Park. There was this big concern over the minnows that kept splashing onto the floor and back. First one of our dads, and then the other, would turn around and say, watch it out the minutes, or be careful, don't spill it the minutes. Neither one of them could speak English worth the damn. They dropped us off and went searching for grape leaves, figuring we'd only get wet and maybe decide to quit. The pond wasn't deep enough to drown a good-sized fish, we made a game of throwing first the minutes and then the minutes into the pond, imitating their accents, and then cracking up and falling to the ground. We didn't catch a single fish, and they didn't do much better with grape leaves. We were wet and miserable driving home, and they were sad and disgusted, but also relieved to have it done. We drove back in silence, staring out our private windows, filling the landscape with our different dreams and losses. Your father broke the silence with a sigh, saying simply, ver vi are, ver vi are. Nothing, meaning, not this ordinary day with its ordinary losses, but the time of his life that had taken him all the way here, America, from all the way there, Armenia the bewildering and inexplicable passage of our mysterious life on Earth. You look back at the, with wonder at the, <laughs> the strangeness and beauty of it all. Um, you can't separate truth and beauty. They're really the same thing. So when you find one, you have the other. And uh, the truth of those experiences are beautiful because we're humans. This is what humans do. And uh, failure or success is just part of the one package. You can't have one without the other. And, you know, it was, it was a great time, though we didn't know it at the time. <laughs> This is a poem about remorse, which is a little sad, and uh, Midwesterners are so, such cheerful people that I hate putting it on you, but there it is. <laughs> it's called Night, Night, yes, Night. It must have been 1950, Racine, Wisconsin. Was I 19? Was my father 60 or 61? the age I am now. It must have been my first car, a Plymouth. My father never drove, nor my mother. Only one Armenian family, as I remember, owned a car back then. It is evening, and I am driving him to the veteran's building for some event or meeting that he is attending. 
We are downtown before I realize that he is uncertain of the address. He is used to walking everywhere and has become disoriented in my car. But I don't realize any of this at the time. I am being impatient with him. I don't like being his chauffeur. I want to get on with my life, not be a helpmate in his. Pull over, he says, reading my thoughts, which I do, feeling a little uneasy, my conscience fighting with my impatience, but I pull over. He gets out and quickly begins his hurried walk, the walk I will always know him by, and that I will always remember when I think of him and think of myself. He gets out in front of Woolworths. It is dark out, but the street lights are not on, and I am there, alone, in the semi-darkness, unable to move, my car stationed at the curb. And I am there still, watching, staring at his back as he moves away, knowing the veteran's building is just three blocks away. I would call if he could hear me, but he is on his own and alone as I am with whatever this is that I am. Actually, it's kind of hard to follow a poem with that, but uh, would you like to hear some more? Sure, yeah. Okay. Everything, everything's, the day ends at night and begins in the morning. It's not like that, at least not, not the way I see it. Autumn. There is a moment at dusk when the earth exhales its last breath of day and time is suspended between departure and arrival, between exit and entry, when all the greening becomes gold and the blue bowl of heaven, a mirror that holds itself up as comforter and compliment, as the other half that is not better for being higher, but being higher looks down on what is of itself but not itself and feels the ascension of the lower pushing its green branches of gold skyward, dying again, again being born. This was written in the Berkshires, where I lived, we lived for some years. Really beautiful, Master, in Massachusetts. Old New England people. <laughs> when these old barns lost their inhabitants, and then their pain, and then all semblance of determined human construction, one, they began to sway to the forms of nature, desiring some final rune desiring some final ruin and return. Two, their bodies ache and sway to the rhythms of the beckoning hills. Three, they carry in their burnt wood the descending rays of the setting sun. Four, their windows are as small as eyes. Five, they wish again to be a falling tree. people remember Willie uh, from around Washington School. So he, lived, he lived around there somewhere he had a wagon. He was um, what we called retarded in those days. He called, called Down Syndrome now, I think. Anyhow, he was one of us. I call it heroes for Willie. Take the men one by one. Shadows, influences, reminders of what but the self, unrecognized, unknown searching as that one did with his wagon alive, smiling his retarded smile into the bright sun against the streets where we found him going and coming away from the busy traffic yet within our own. His moment of truth forever inside us, his wagon 
trailing behind. Some of you may remember Charlie Margosian. He had a tavern on Douglas Avenue, right around where the yard arm is now, I think. And uh, this is called CM because he was still alive when I wrote it. And I do that a lot with people who are living. I protect them. <laughs> He stood inside the window door of his tavern on Douglas Avenue on that stark block of factories and businesses that served workers, stragglers, the down and out, waiting for the first passerby in the early morning light when the call of seagulls, the distant foghorn, were the only sound, knocking on the window with his knuckles, motioning the stranger to come inside so his first drink of the day would not be taken alone and apart. Mm. Mm. I'll make this the last poem. I don't see any more poems on the table, so. Um, the Crab and Minnow Bait Garages. Bill Zaylor Jr. This was my idea of what a business should be and could be if it was run by someone. Did I read this poem already? No. Someone who was in possession of his life. For once, such a garage had been ours, but it was so worn, lopsided, and dilapidated that it wasn't good for anything but maybe father's uh, garden tools. And so mother rented it to our next door neighbor, Bill Zaylor, for 50 cents a month. <laughs> he put in minnow tanks and large buckets for crabs and night crawlers with a contraption that kept the water moving, creating oxygen for the living minnows he sold for a quarter a dozen. Though, <clears throat> though I don't recall ever seeing any customer cough up any such coin or even make an entrance into that holy shrine. Where I hung out whenever I could, along with Bill's nephews, who were my buddies and helpmates. And so with all in all, it looked to me like the greatest American enterprise imaginable, with a future as bright and as certain as the sorrow that brooded on our side of the fence, where we were housing the past, while inching towards our own new America, over which my imagination wandered, my eyes on the net, nets pulled out for drying in their yard, their dog Bozo keeping me at bay, sensing my foreignness and my fear, my inability to insinuate myself into the easy ways of his master and his cohorts, those casual designers of milieus and dramas, American, vast, unending panoramas, of casual sense. Well, thank you. My publishers give me permission. This book sells for 18, but he's given me permission to sell for 15 because it's my hometown and I want you to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming. Yeah? David, let me ask you a question before you. You're not going to have a chance to answer this before you leave. I noticed you've been reading all your poetry at these sessions, which of course was enjoyable and lo lovely, but you have some wonderful prose. Uh, some of your books that uh, we always disagree on which one's best, but uh, you have really good vignettes of the scene and people in those books as well. I'm wondering if you ever read selections as part of your reading. You want me to read something from the book, you mean? No, is that what you're asking? I, mean, I, I can't hear you very well, Andy. Oh, I'm saying, how come you don't do that? Why don't you do that as part of your reading? Or Why you don't I? I? I think um, prose is easy to read. Poetry is a little hard. It's not hard to understand necessarily. Uh, my poetry certainly is very easy to understand. But it, it really needs the poet's voice to achieve perfection within its own form. It, it, it doesn't work without the language of the poet because his breath controls the line, the measure of the poem. So um, it, isn't, it doesn't reach its full, um, I can't think of the word for some reason, its full flavor 
<clears throat> until it's heard by the poet. So you can read my prose anywhere, anytime, and it's what it is. You know, it's not going to be improved by my voice, but my poetry is. And so that's why I wrote. Good, good answer. Well, <laughs> I was going to suggest that you read a paragraph from your new book. A paragraph? Part two. It's pretty hard to limit me, you know. <laughs> you open the door to my ego, it's very hard to shut the door. <laughs> I'll tell you what I read. No, there's, there's something, up, here it is, 15, Island Park. This, this park meant as much to me as, as anything in life. Openly hidden in the middle of our town, where the river stopped, turned around on itself, inhaling once, twice in a loop, before exhaling again in the direction of the factories, tanneries, and bridges of commerce. Island Park was the held breath of grace, the one complete gift of love to the city and its people. It was there I discovered art and fortunately thought of it, neither as discovery or art, but only as wonder. For I saw in man's art his uncontrollable urge to speak intimately with nature by holding up what he had made to mirror back what he had seen. For there at the bottom of Liberty Street, where it entered the park in the backyard of the house facing the water and bridge, was a rock garden with a bridge that was a replica in miniature of the bridge I had started to cross and was looking back from now my first experience of another world, the palpable world of the imagination. There too, where I first discovered art, I learned about love. And because love came first, everything else followed. It was my earliest memory of life. My father carrying me in his arms along the worn path with the bushes around and above stirring under a warm breeze and another was there perhaps my uncle and something moved amongst us a warm feeling a feeling of grace a blessing that i knew to be love under the same bridge i craft forbade myself for myself and also to sell to the fishermen on lake michigan the crabbing was best there because of the rocky bottom where the crabs hid and waited, allowing us to coax them out with pieces of liver tied to butcher string that dangled from a cut branch, all but the latter purchased from the Baranian grocery store on State Street. Mr. Baranian would always wrap extra string around the white butcher paper for he knew where we were headed. We would stand there silently enraptured by the odors of Armenia that oozed forth from the spices on the shelves as well as from the open lentil and buller sacks. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> now you have to buy my book. And then you get the set you can the next page. Wow. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll take it. What brought Armenians to Racine? What brought Armenians to Racine? What factory was there particular? Well, I think they were just hired off the docks, largely. Some came ahead in order to make money to go back. And, um, and then they got stuck here. You know, then the massacres came, the genocide came. But it was mainly, it was the industry. I just wondered why here, why not Chicago or Kenosha? More factories. <laughs> More factories. It was just business, just work. You know, there was work for them here. Work. Yeah. When did your father come here? What year? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Probably 19. So, in the 20s. In the 20s? That's right. He was, in, he was in the Army in the First World War, the uh -huh. U.S. Army. And then, uh, then he sent for my mother. Oh, well, you know, you can read about it. I've written yeah. about all of it. So any other questions? Yeah. We can.